So well, what we started last week, I'll just recap quickly, was that the, the simple solution to the question of Job that's offered by, uh, by the Malbim, and we saw this last week, is that Job is a, is, it fears God. But we said he fears God like somebody in India would fear God. He's not a Jew. He, he has fear of God in the sense that today we fear gravity, that I'm not going to go over the edge of the balcony. Because I know that something negative is going to happen. And his whole, everything he does, he's very frum in that sense. And he's constantly worried that maybe he did something wrong and his children did something wrong. He's always, and, and Mamish, you can go to India, you'll see going like this, exactly the same thing. No difference. Mamish fear of God, fear of God in their hearts. But what they mean by God is that God is a collection of laws. And it's, it's a little, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's even, you know, I said it's like going to the, to the mechanic. When you talk to him, even though you think you understood, maybe you didn't understand fully, maybe you said this, and everybody comes out feeling I didn't understand everything that went on. Why? Because it's something very technical. So there's always this fear in, in, in people who have an, uh, a picture of God as some kind of collection of laws that maybe I missed something. Maybe something. Yeah. And if something negative happens, that's basically what his friends tell him when they come. You must have done something wrong. <laughs> There's no other option. We, we can't explain it any other way. How could somebody as God fearing and uh, and uh, so uh, subservient to God be punished in this way? You must have done something wrong. And Job, when he starts cursing God, he really doesn't curse God himself first. He first curses the lower manifestation of God, which he calls astrology. So he curses his day, and that's what we read last time, right? And then Elihu comes along, and we're not, not going to go so much into Elihu right now, but Elihu ben Rachel is the fourth uh, person that comes to console him, and he's younger. And he says this very important statement in the beginning, which we did read. He said, I thought that... Um, he said, it's 32-7. He said, I said, days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. So he had this picture that the elders would know, right? Because the elders are supposed to have collected a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom, and they know how God works and so on. And yet, their direction doesn't make sense to him. Like, it can't be that Job did something wrong. He's such a... And even if he did, so that's, that's the problem that he missed. Like, again, it's like people have this, even this feeling towards Allah today, that, you know, I have to do everything exactly right and then, psychologically, you get into this problem, which is, and a lot of people have this, that if I once turned the light on on Shabbos and nothing happened, Mamish, even adults have this problem. Nobody can really free himself from it. And nothing happened. Does that mean that none of it means anything? Because I thought that it all was very, very critical. And the book of Job which, according to one tradition, was written by Moshe Rabbeinu, is, is an attempt to explain why we don't see Hashem that way. Like, that on the one hand, it is important not to put the light on, on Shabbos. On the other hand, your well-being in the world is much more complex. And why is it much more complex? Because judgment is not at that level. It's, it's something else. So we explained last time that really to understand Hashem's judgment, to be able to understand the real laws of the universe, you have to have a higher form of wisdom, which is called seeing things coming into being and not learning from experience. It's a different type of wisdom. The wisdom that these elders had came from experience, from being in the world like science today. But we've done a lot of experiments and we have some picture of what's going on or we know how to build bridges and we know how to do this. We learned from experience from all the times that stuff crashed. I was talking to a civil engineer on Chavez who comes to one of my shirin, and he told me that, um, that in America they've stopped building with steel. I didn't know that. Like bridges. Because it turns out that the pigeons, their excrement is acidic. And over years it breaks the steel. So they coat it today, like in Israel, they do the same thing. They coat it with, uh, with cement. By the winter? 
here there's not, there's not enough steel and there's not enough experience with it. In fact, he told me there was a few times that they tried to bring uh, uh, crews that knew how to work with steel, and the whole thing didn't work so well. Because, uh, it's just, uh, and in the end, when it comes to bridges and stuff like that, in the end everybody uses cement now, because, because of the pigeons and whatever. Anyway, so it's like experience. You learn over time, even something that you thought was so perfect and so good, and we had it. But but to have wisdom that sees what will come into being, that comes from a completely different place. That's sort of like a little bit like closer to Ruach HaKodesh. What leads a person to that type of wisdom? That's higher fear, that's called, or higher awe. Yira'ila. And really, that's the point of God revealing himself to Job at the end. It's to give him this higher awe to teach him a different way of conducting himself in the world. Okay. And this different way, it's almost like this is an introduction to Yiddishkeit. And we said that in therapy it becomes really essential because most of us get locked into some kind of routine, some kind of pattern that we follow, and we think we have it figured out. And then suddenly it stops working, and the only thing we can come up with is that we did something wrong. Instead of understanding a lot of times that you have to give space to something new being formed. Why? Because Hashem is telling you, look, it's very nice what you did with me so far, but I'm much more than that. Your life is much more than that. And so if it's all the time, it's very hard. I don't know if a person can go through this all the time. But I think it comes in phases. Like there are some years that you sort of have it figured out and you think you know what's going on. And then suddenly everything seems to come crashing. Like, like Job. It's like one after another. You get another, another, thing, another thing happens. And here I'm talking about therapy that has, that, that's not about dealing with a person's uh, psychological issues so much. As much as opening them up to a new reality. To something new that can be formed. And, and that requires this higher fear, to come to this wisdom that you can see yourself being born, see yourself being created as something new, requires this higher wisdom. And that's what, uh, sorry, requires this higher fear. And that's what Hashem was trying to show Job at the end. Okay. So, what I wanted uh, to focus on today... Pass these pages out. It's a lot of Hebrew, but it's not so terrible. <laughs> There's also English in it. started off to get into Nakum, um, I didn't do a lot of these, but there's only three, so there are two pages each. To, to, to get into this whole thing, there's, there's two things, I mentioned first of all a saying from the Baal Shem Tov. he has a very powerful saying that I think is many times, I mean, it's understood in so many different ways. Um, but I think a lot of them are, they miss the point. Like, they get some of it, but not, I think, the whole um, depth behind what he said. The Valsam once said, that, or he was fond of saying, that sometimes not keeping the Torah is how to keep it. Some, he said in Hebrew, bitula ukiuma. That sometimes a person has to not keep Torah in order to keep it. Where did he get this from? He got it from, the source really is from, from the sages. The sages say that that a person can't really understand Torah until he um, like he stumbles over them. He, he does it wrong. <laughs> the Baal Shem Tov took it like one step further. He says sometimes to, to really get Torah you have to 
not good. Does that have anything to do with like a prophet telling you to listen to the prophet no matter what they okay. say? You're already way, way ahead. <laughs> we'll, we'll get the prophecy, we'll see. When, when, sometimes when you're way ahead, and, and it's not filled up in the middle, so it doesn't stand too strong. So we're going to have to fill it up. But, but that's the, the general direction. Um, basically what Job had in the end was a prophetic experience. So there's something about you know, this higher fear and this higher uh, wisdom being linked with prophecy. And um, this is the type of, pro of wisdom that a prophet has. It's, or it's very close to see what's coming into being. Another way of saying that would be to see the future, basically. So it's one form of explaining what prophecy is. But to get back to this, he used to say, Sometimes to keep the Torah, and he meant it specifically with learning. He said sometimes, that, that's how it was usually explained, that in order for a person to come back with fresh energy and to be able to learn again, he has to stop learning for a while. Right? He has to need batel mi but it's much deeper than that. Really what he's saying is something that we, we, we've talked about this a lot of times. When somebody would come to the Baal Shem Tov, it was a big Talmud Chacham. They had this thing, don't, come, don't go to the Baal Shem Tov, he's a wizard. Because he'll make you forget everything that you learned. And really what the Baal Shem Tov was doing was showing that, wait a minute, the whole thing that you learned is, is like, again, Job's God. Job's version of God. It's all, it all fits perfectly He's a big Talmud Chacham, he knows exactly how everything fits together and so on and so forth. And then he would suddenly show him one blind spot that he can't explain. The thing that's in the middle, that's really holding everything together, but he can't see it because it's like the, where the optic nerve connects to the retina. You, you can't see there. And he would show them that place. And, and suddenly everything would come falling apart. And they would say, like, my whole Torah, I forgot my whole Torah, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. That, that's really the type of bittle he was talking about. That sometimes you have to unlearn everything that you learn to make room for something completely different. And even in Torah, if you continue to just cling on to what you knew yesterday, it becomes a form of a surrogate for Hashem. Instead of the direct connection with, with Hashem, which constantly is changing, constantly is uh, shifting. And you have to be on your feet to get it. You have to, you have to be in touch with Hashem in order to, to go through those transitions. So that's what the Baal Shem used to say, the bitulau kiuma. Now there's a sikha from the Rabbi based on Job, based on, uh, on the beginning part of Job. And he asks the simple question, which is really, we'll see in a moment, but here the Satan comes and he, and he says, we said, you can explain this in terms of the person's own psyche. Satan comes and, 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 and Hashem says the same, the good side, and the psyche says, see how great he is, he's such a good, even though you hurt him and you changed the rules on him and so on, in the end he didn't change, he continued to be God-fearing. So says Satan, it's because you didn't let me touch his body, but let me touch his body, let me give him physical ailment, and you'll see how we, everything changes, because those are the real rules, everything around is, is secondary. So when, when, when Hashem gives him that permission, suddenly Job breaks down. That he really can't handle. So this all happened, according to Chazal, it says, Vayhiyayom, that's how it says, it, it was on the day, but the first, uh, the second verse of, uh, second verse? Uh, verse 6, now there was a day, here it says, but it was on that day. Which day is it talking about? Rosh Hashanah. The Rosh Hashanah is the time that everybody is judged. So that, that was the day that Satan came to Hashem, and Hashem went through this uh, whole process of telling him, Job is such a great person, and, and so on. So the Rebbe starts from, from this, uh, from this uh, um, point, and says, we Jews are really smart. Why? Because since Satan comes on Rosh Hashanah, we learn from Job that he comes on Rosh Hashanah to judge, he's in the judgment. So what do we do? We confuse him. <laughs> we found it, we figured out a way to confuse him. And since he's confused, he doesn't know when Rosh Hashanah is, so we get out of it. Like we don't go into this whole debate with him and, and we're out of it. So the Rebbe says it's very, you know, when, you, when you hear it as a child, maybe you, say you, you accept it. And as you grow older, like, what are you going to confuse him? And, but what we're going to see today is the Rebbe gives a, a tremendous explanation of what this means. And he explains it in terms of personal psychology. What does it mean to confuse 
the Yetzir Hara in me? What does it mean to confuse the Satan in me? And how do you do that? So let, let's read a little from the Sikha. So we'll, we'll also skip a little because it's, it's, it's a little too long for, for the Shira, but you can read it later. You can also find it online if you just search for some of the other words here. One of the reasons that we do not mention Rosh Chodesh and the Rosh Hashanah prayer is, is to confuse the Satan. So, say, so says the Shulchan Aram. So that he should not know that today is Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. And therefore he will not accuse us. The same concept to confuse the Satan is also brought as a reason for the Minog not to mention to bless the month of Tishrei and the, Shab- and the Shabbos preceding it. Right? Because we don't, we don't, we don't uh, do Birka Sachodesh for Tishrei. That's the one month that we don't, uh, we don't say Birka Sachodesh. There's another thing that we, that we stop doing, right? There's another yeah. thing we don't do. We, stop, we don't blow the shofar the day before. So now, all these things are, if we'll bring this in a moment, all these things are meant to confuse Satan. Most of the amount? Is there a certain amount we do? We huh? add extra on huh? Ah, the, the, the last day? Yeah. No. The point is, as we'll see, that he thinks that we're done. Rosh Hashanah, they stopped blowing. Rosh Hashanah already passed, I missed it. And uh, he doesn't think about coming. It's a little, kind of a little childish when you hear these explanations. Right? We all laugh at them. because really, really gonna... We'll see in a moment how deep this is. At first glance, it is not understood. The Satan, the adversary, is an angel. and comes to the supernal court and has explained in the book of Job that the Satan came on the day of judgment on Rosh Hashanah among the angels of God to stand beside the Lord. How then can we say that we can confuse him and mislead him in, in such a simple thing that he should not know because of these customs that it is Rosh Hashanah, something that is well publicized, printed in calendars, he even reads calendars. <coughs> What's going on? He's up to date. He has an <laughs> The Levush also brings the, brings the same reason. The Levush is one of the Farshim Lashulchan Aruch, Baal Levush, Mordechai Yafi in order to confuse the Satan so that he will not know that it is Rosh Hashanah, but he adds, since it, is not, it has not been sanctified, meaning the month of Tishrei has not been sanctified. So he, he, he says it's not just that we didn't uh, say a bracha for Rosh Chodesh, it's as if we didn't do san- sanctification, like the, the, in time of the, that they uh, did the, the months by seeing the uh, birth of the new moon, it was called sanctifying. God sanctified it, so it is sanctified. So the Baal Shem says, so we sanctify or we, we bless 11 months, and Hashem blesses the 12th to make it up for us. But the point is here that by not doing this, we're confusing the Yitzhar Ha. Accordingly, we could explain, according to the known law, that the sending of the new months is dependent on Beitin. Rosh Chodesh is established only through the sanctification by Jews, through the act of Beitin. Yidin establishing the day as Rosh Chodesh, it becomes Rosh Chodesh. So, much, so we could say that what does it mean that we don't sanctify? Since we didn't sanctify it, so really he doesn't know which day it is, because we didn't. But still, it also doesn't make any sense. What He's so dependent on what we say and what we don't say. That, and again, our, our calendar is not dependent on sanctifying the moon. It's not dependent on any of this. It's gonna be, we know, everybody knows exactly where Rosh Hashanah is going to be. So, so this doesn't make uh, too much sense. So I'm skipping a little bit. Um, one could understand, the next paragraph, that by not mentioning Rosh Chodesh in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, and by not mentioning it in the preceding Shabbat, Shabbat in the Birkat Chodesh, that it is as if it was not said as Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. And consequently, Satan doesn't know with certainty that the day is Rosh Hashanah, because, but, but this answer is not sufficient, like we said, because why? On Rosh Hashanah we do many things in which it is shown and stressed that the day is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. How, how therefore can we say that because we did not sanctify it, the Satan doesn't know that it's Rosh Hashanah? And mainly, for the, the reason for confusing the Satan is brought regarding two customs which have no relation to the subject of Rosh Chodesh. It's, it's very important to, uh, to understand the, these are customs. So by customs, that's where I'm going to, to get him, that's where his, uh, his uh, soft spot is, and he's going to get all confused. It all seems very strange. Okay. So let's see. Um, three. I'm going. It's giving you three. We can understand by prefacing that this concept of confusing the Satan is also brought as a reason for the minhag of blowing shofar during the month of Elul. Through this, we confuse the Satan so that he should not know when it is Rosh Hashanah. And this is also not understood as above. How can we fool the Satan that he should not know when, when Rosh Hashanah is? The concept of confusing Rosh, uh, the Satan 
in connection with Rosh Hashanah in the, is found in the Talmud by the general mitzvah of shofar blowing on Rosh Hashanah. There's another thing that we do on Rosh Hashanah itself. Right? We also confuse him then. How? Rabbi Isaac said, why do we sound the tkiah and the trua, sitting and then again sound the tkiah and the trua standing? Why do we have two sets of blowing the shofar? We do it standing up, and we also do it sitting down. They're called miyusha. In the Chabad, you stand, you stand up for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why nobody knows about this in Chabad. But really, there are two sets. There's a set that you do before Mosaf and during Mosaf. Those are standing up. And then, according to the Gemara, once you, you're finished with Mosaf, with the Chazar Sashat, then you sit down after, uh, after that, and you sit down, and there's another uh, 30 uh, yeah, sounds that you do. Yeah. And, and everybody stands up for those also. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it, because, it, because it also makes sense. Why? Because if you really want to confuse him, so you don't want to make a difference between them. <laughs> say, can, you're really confusing him. Now he's really confused. Now he really doesn't know what he's doing. In any case. Um, so Rashi explains there, why do we do this? It, it, it is so as to confuse the accuser, the same Rashi explains there so that he should not accuse. When he hears the Jews treasuring the mitzvot, his words are silenced. Here it's a little bit different. He says, it's not that he won't know which, which but he sees that Jews treasure the mitzvot, so they do more tkiah than they knew, need to. You only need 30, and they do 60, or even 100. And they see, he sees how much we love the mitzvot, so then it silences the words of the accusing Satan. Accordingly, we can explain, also explain the concept of confusing the Satan with regard to the tkiot in the month of Belo. The purpose of the Kiyot of the month of Velu, as is known, is in order to warn Am Yisrael to do tshuva. As it states, will a shofar be sounded in the city and the people will not quake? Therefore, through the Yidim blowing shofar and becoming awakened with tshuva, it finished the battery. It's not done yet. It won't, uh, it won't make it. Okay. But uh, at least we'll go out of Okay. So thinking that through their tshuva in the month of El, that, that already in all the Jews have been vindicated in judgment, and therefore there's no point to accuse, and he has nothing to use to accuse in Rosh Hashanah, and effectively the silence is in. Okay, so that, like, like all the sikhahs that the Rebbe does, he gives a lot of possibilities, and then he cuts them down. These can't work. None of these is, is going to work. Okay. So, so what, what, what do we do? How, how do we understand this whole thing of, of, um, of, of, uh, of uh, confusing things? So I'm going to skip all, all the rest. And we'll just go to the end. Let me see, where is it? I remember it in the Hebrew. This explanation is not accurate. Read, read it, because he goes through still Six? another option, oh, and, he, yeah. and he takes that down. Yeah. And now in 8, eight. Mm-hmm. He, he has another question and, and another option that he gives him. Finally, finally, in the end, um, yeah. it's an 8. Yeah. I just have to find exactly where it is. Chassidim? Sorry. Um, let's see, let's see. Yes, it's with the Chassidim. According to this order, there is a question on the opposite. How is it possible that Yudin should actually do all this? Meaning, what, what do we do? How do we refrain from doing something? Really, in the end, what confuses Satan, that's the answer that he comes to, is that we don't do things. That's what confuses him. We don't do Birkas HaChodesh. We don't say, we don't mention Rosh Chodesh in the davening of Rosh Hashanah, even though it's Rosh Chodesh. We don't blow shofar the day before. It's all in the manner of refraining from doing something. And the refraining from doing something, that's what confuses him. So you begin to see where this is going. Let's read, let's read 8. How is it possible that Yiddin should actually do all this? Meaning, true, there is effect, there is effect of the intent of confusing the same. But as above, at the very end, the Yiddin miss out on that day, in those days, the particular service there. The awakening of the shofar we miss, blowing on every Rosh Hashanah. The awakening of Rosh Hodesh, and that's for the completion of the Torah, in the beginning of the Torah. It says, actually, that we should have finished and, and ended the Torah, finished and started the Torah on Rosh Hashanah itself. We don't do it. We, we, we save it for Simcha Torah. 
even though we should have done on Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because everything is to be viewed as the same. The explanation is, this itself, that one refrains from these things is in order to confuse the Satan. And it must and does bring a deeper awakening of tshuva than that which is achieved through fulfilling the above-mentioned things. To not do something that you think is good and right is sometimes more important than doing that thing that you know that even Hashem commanded you to do. There's, an, there's something extra there. Let's see how, how, how can we understand this. The awakening of tshuva in a manner of a voice that emanates from the inner depths of the heart is evoked through the bitterness of one's soul that is distanced distance from Hashem, which is utterly far from Him. The refraining brings about a sense of bitterness. It's not that I'm just refraining and I'm confusing by making like an empty void. It's by understanding that I don't understand. It's that I'm, maybe I'm not worthy to understand. Okay? Say it like this. If a person's um, tired of learning, he's tired of, 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 uh, of doing things, <laughs> the natural inclination that people have is, well, there's a problem with the Torah. There's a problem with what I'm doing. He doesn't think, maybe there's a problem with me. Meaning, maybe I've lost my energy because I feel, I feel too close to the whole thing. I feel too familiar with it. It's become a pattern. It's become something that I just do by rote. Not, not because I do it by rote, because I don't care. Because I think I've got to figure it figured out. I understand it already. And I'm worthy of the whole thing. Let's see a, 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 a story that he brings. So the awakening of tshuva really depends on how distant a person feels from Hashem. How much bitterness, and bitterness here is the feeling of distance. It's not bitterness in the sense that I'm bitter, and I'm angry at everything. But I'm bitter in the sense of I'm not where I should be. And this bitterness of his distance from Hashem is felt by a Jew in a very strong manner through his contemplating that these aforementioned good things are being withheld from him, just in order to confuse the Satan. Mm-hmm. Meaning that if you were on a higher level, you, would, you wouldn't have a problem with the Satan at all. The reason that you have to conf- confront Satan here and try to confuse him and be in, you're in the debate with him is because you feel that you've already gotten it, that you understand it all. You, are, uh, you have no Yira in the end. Yira means distance from Hashem. It's not distance because I did something bad. It's distance because I cannot fathom what this all means. Okay. He feels, this, uh, he feels his situation that, that, that the Satan has such a power against him that we must, because of it, take away an aspect of Shofar blowing, mention, mentioning Rosh Hashanah and reading Parashat Bereshit and Rosh Hashanah. And additionally, in some part, the awakening of Tshuva is deeper than that which is achieved through Shofar blowing. The awakening of Tshuva from Shofar blowing comes about from a thing which is external to him. But here, what's coming about is from him alone, from him himself. So I'm skipping. And one could say that this is like the story from the Rebbe, the Hasidim told about the Rebbe Rishab in the beginning of his leadership. A beautiful story that illustrates this perfectly. A Jew came for Echidus, a private audience to the Rebbe Rishab, and requested a blessing in a serious matter, which required a great arousal of heavenly mercy. But the Rebbe answered that he could not help him in this regard. So here's this person spilling his guts out. And he tells him, I don't know how to help you. I can't, I, not I don't know, I can't help you.